Well, thank you all so much for inviting me to come down, and thanks for your patience with the technology. Um, this is a show that has audio in it, and it's still going to have audio in it, because I think we've figured out how to make it work. Um, and if you're just as patient as you have been so far through all the little glitches, then we're going to do just fine. Um, so yeah, I'm Bridget. Uh, I come by birding um, through my own love and passion for it. In fact, I was totally turned off from birding when I first met birders, which was in Massachusetts. They were obnoxious and rude and competitive, and I really didn't want to have anything to do with them. <laughs> and it wasn't until I moved to Vermont and started hanging out with the folks here in the Green Mountain State who are much more laid back and friendly and like to share their knowledge um, that I've really started to fall in love with bird watching. And so what I'd like to do today is share some tips and tricks so that you can ease into spring and meet some new birds here um, in the great state of Vermont and maybe even beyond that. So my first question for all of you, how many of you are um, bird feeder people? You got feeders up at home, awesome, okay, great. How many of you, um, would consider yourself um, someone who's gonna go and chase a bird. Go after, oh, we got some chasers in the room. How many of you are just like, oh, I'm gonna bird where I am and this is awesome and I get really excited by whatever lands in front of me. Yeah, you can do both. You can raise your hand for both. That's totally allowed. Um, how many of you are listers? You've got that list of how many birds you've had in a lifetime. Okay, anybody? I know, or lots of little lists like all scattered around, great. Good, does, do any, does anybody know their number? I don't know my number. I have a list, but I don't know my number. What, yeah, what's your number? Oh, number of species. Yeah, awesome, okay, so that's definitely outside of Vermont birding. Yes, yes for real. <laughs> that, that's even like yes. out of the country birding. Yes, yes. awesome, very cool, good. Um, so whether you've had like three birds on your life list or, or 1,500, <laughs> There's always something new to see, and that's what I enjoy so much about it. My birding has changed a little bit. I am now a mom of three small children, five, four, and three. So I am seeing the world through a whole new lens when it comes to birding, and it is just as magical as when I discovered it myself. All right, so tonight, bird is a verb because it's all about action. Tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about becoming a birder. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about birding gear, about training your eye, training your ear, about getting a sense of place and understanding the habitats and natural communities for birds, um, and then paying it forward a little bit. So I have one slide, just one slide, um, that's like a little bit doom and gloom, and then we're gonna skip off of it. But it's just something to kind of root you in the fact that your passion and your love for birds in a very simple way um, by contributing, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, you can kind of pay it forward so we can keep them on our landscape here. That's me and my sister, <clears throat> birding off the coast of Maine, totally in love with borrowed spotting scopes at the time. Um, we, uh, I've evolved, I have my own scope now, which is very, very exciting when it comes to gear. So, right, when it comes to gear, birding doesn't have to be a super expensive sport. What I love right now is that a lot of the tech um, and the gear, the prices are coming down on because the science is kind of caught up with things like lenses and stuff like that. So it's not, it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. You definitely want a pair of binoculars. There is something called naked birding, which means no, you're not gonna go out nude. You're gonna bird without binoculars, which is a challenge in and of itself. And sometimes you just end up birding that way. Um, but a good pair of binoculars is really great when you get really into it. You have a pair for the car and a pair for in the house and a pair for the office. Um, you got sets everywhere. Um, binoculars can run anywhere from, I mean, $250 for a fairly good pair up to you could spend a thousand. You could probably spend two thousand on a pair of binoculars. But a good mid-range pair of binoculars you can get for under $500 with really great optics. It's what's really nice now about them. But you do want to get a good pair of binoculars and then you want to learn how to take care of them. So um, my big thing with folks is don't use your shirt to wipe the lens of your binoculars. I did that with my first pair, not very smart. Um, so take care of them just like you would take, well maybe not your glasses because I'm really bad at taking care of my glasses too. Um, but once you make that investment, make sure you're going you're gonna to care for them the best you can. Field guides. So there are all different kinds of field guides out there. Um, one of my biggest mistakes when I first started birding is I got a guide to birds of North America. 
yeah, and then it's like totally overwhelming. It, it's, it's just too much. So um, birds of the, uh, um, like eastern birds or western birds, wherever you might be traveling, there's often a bird guide for um, those different um, places that you might be going to. And then there are different specialty guides. So I carry um, Sibley's guides, and I carry the larger one because when I'm leading a group, I like to have the larger pictures and all of the different plumages in the book. My husband now has my Sibley's Guide to Eastern Birds tucked in his car so that when he's out and he can't get a hold of me, he can look up the bird. Um, and then there are some other guides um, that are out there that are, are really different. And this is one I wanted to share with you. Um, this is a Crossley um, ID guide um, to Eastern Birds. And I really didn't like this when I first looked at it. And I'll show you why. I'm not big on pictures of birds, photographs of birds. I've always liked um, drawings of birds in my field guide, which is why I like Sibley's and I didn't gravitate towards Audubon. But this book, and I didn't like it until I went and saw him speak. I saw him speak at the Adirondack Burning Festival. And he talked about how your brain processes information and how with birding, it's really good to have the context or the habitat for the bird. So what he's done is he's created a plate for each bird that represents that bird in its optimum habitat. And it's all these different views of the bird and perspectives of the bird from near and far and close and this shot, the back shot, and the shot when you're looking up underneath it. So for a blue jay, you get all of these different, uh, all these different photographs for it. So it's really nice. This is the book that I like to go to when I want to fine tune my brain, like say I'm going out looking for a specific warbler because I know it's moving through. I'm going to go and study this page before I go out in the field. So you can really kind of blow up your budget with uh, field guides as well. Um, and definitely, this isn't one you, that you're going to want to carry around with you. Um, there are some other guides. This one is another one. Oh, this will hurt your brain, but it's in such a good way. So this is the Warbler Guide. I think this is about two years old now. Tom Stevenson and Scott Whittle. Um, and what I love about this, uh, there's so many things I love about this. Um, it ha it, and this is another photograph book. This is totally breaking down how I've been using guides. Um, and again, it gives all of these different perspectives of the bird um, and different shots of, of close-ups of the bird. So sometimes when you're looking through the canopy and you just see the tail, well, here's what just the tail looks like. Um, the other piece that I like are these um, graphics where you get the silhouette of the bird. You get this, this um, gosh, it's almost like a Charlie Harper rendering of the bird and its coloration. Um, and so it's just an oval with like a triangle off the back and then it divides the bird up into quadrants and how you might see um, the plumage on that bird. The tail, um, in there's a Peterson's Warbler Guide that just has all tail shots of warblers, just all butts. It's great, really good with kids too. Um, and then the range map, um, this one is where you will find the bird in its habitat. So is it gonna be high up in the tree? Is it gonna be down low? Is it gonna be on the ground? Okay, so, and this is part of kind of learning how to look and then what kind of um, group of birds it fits in, whether it's perching or wading or whatnot. So really awesome, awesome new book that's out. Now, if you're really into tech, you might have played with this. Has anybody played with this yet? This is great, right? So Merlin's really fun. So it's an app that you can get on your iPhone um, and on an Android. And so basically Merlin pulls from something called eBird. And eBird is an online platform where people like Martha, where's Martha, put all of her sightings. Um, and so Martha's sightings then become part of what makes this app work. Because what it does is it decides where you are. So it asks you a bunch of questions and it pulls from your, your phone, where are you at? It asks you, what size was the bird? What color was the bird? When did you see the bird and what was the bird doing? And then it goes into eBird and it pulls out all the information about different types of bird that, that might fit all those different categories and it's gonna throw you out a bunch of different options that you can look at to try to help you figure out what you're looking at. 
Um, I don't use this too much, but um, a lot of uh, friends and folks that have started and teachers are using this. Um, and it's a really great way to train your brain on how to look, which we're going to also talk about tonight. How many of you have used this again? I'm just curious. How many of you just downloaded it? I saw that over there. <laughs> good, good, good. It's so fun. It's really, really fun. And it's fun when it's wrong, too. You're like, no, that's not what it is. So let's talk a little bit about learning to look. One of the things I found really hard when I started burning is I was really excited about going out and just trying to learn as much as I could all the time. And you know, you get your binoculars and you're excited because you have a brand new pair of binoculars, but then you gotta learn how to get the binoculars on the bird, right? And by the time you find the bird in the binoculars, the bird is gone, okay? So here's, here's my tip for that, right? You're like, that is so me. So listen. <laughs> you're like, tell me what it is. Okay, so here's the, the key. So if the bird is the exit sign, and these are my binoculars, I'm gonna keep my eye on the exit sign, and I'm gonna bring the binoculars up to my face. Most people do this, they're like, there's the bird. Here's my binoculars, I'm gonna do this. Like, that's totally over-exaggerated, but that's kind of what happens, okay? The other thing that I like to do when I'm looking at that bird is I, in my peripheral vision, I'm looking for things on either side that as I'm trying to get there, get to where the bird is, those, once they come into the field of view, I know I'm close. But if you keep your eye on that bird and put your binoculars up to your eyes, you're gonna have a better chance of getting on that bird. The other thing is to stay with the bird. Don't put your binoculars down and go for the book. This is the other thing that people always do. <gasps> I saw it, what is it, right? And you're po pointing things into Merlin and you're flipping through the bird guide. So stay with the bird as long as you can and then use some of the tips that we're gonna talk about to train your eye how to get as much information as you can so that when you go to Merlin or your bird book, you're gonna have success. So we're gonna talk about training your eye to see shapes, both silhouette and posture training your eye to look at plumage, and then watching for key behaviors. There we go. All right, size. Size can really be um, frustrating, right? It was, it was big, it was small, right? But it all depends on what's around you and the perspective and how far away you are from it. Um, I was having a discussion with my son this morning about the sun, and then we were talking about planets, and he said, oh, well, the sun's really tiny, right? Mom, it's like this big. And I was like, no, honey, it's huge, but it's so far away from us, it looks really small. So it's that same sort of thing. It makes it hard to kind of use shape or size, pardon me. So what you wanna do is train your brain to think, is it bigger than a robin or smaller than a robin? And if it's smaller than a robin, is it between sparrow and robin, or is it smaller than a sparrow, okay? And if it's bigger than a robin, is it as big as a crow or bigger than that? So it gives you some reference points for that when you're looking at the bird. This slide I love. Okay, so silhouettes. Sometimes you can figure out what the bird is or get a jump start on what the bird is without even seeing any of the field marks for the bird, okay? So I just want you to take a minute and look at this slide, see how many different birds you can find, and then See if you're like, oh, I know what that is. Or I think I know what that is. So last year um, in the spring, probably around this time of year, uh, I had just dropped the kids off at, at uh, school and I had the radio cranked up and I was on my way home and I was probably driving a little bit too fast. And I was just enjoying the day, it was beautiful. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a bird on the wire and I went, whoa, that's different. And so I pulled the car around, and it was a northern shrike sitting up on the telephone wire. But it was just the silhouette and the general shape that made me stop and say, OK, that's got to be something else, right? And you got to look at a lot of birds to start to train your brain that way. But take the time to do that, right? Like if we look, how about this one? What, what does that one look like? A robin, right? Maybe, could it be maybe a mockingbird? Maybe, right? That's kind of around the same shape. What's this one? Hummingbird, yes. Okay, you got that one down, done. Um, how about the ones way up at the top? Woo, geese. All right, this one. Owl. Uh, let's go down here. Yeah, like a sandpiper, right? And we have upland sandpipers, and we have killdeer and woodcock that have that sandpiper-like shape. High five. 
That's really good. Awesome. All right, how about this one? Great. Um, this one? That one. Yes. Oh, I have two Carolina wrens in my backyard. I love them. All right, how about, OK, so these two threw me off. This one and that one. And it, right. With no tail. And the other one is grackle. OK. And now I won't ever look at, st I won't, I got to, next time I see a grackle or a starling, I'm going to stop and look because I'm like, oh, there's that distinction there. Um, these might, yeah, the, the really tiny ones are hard. So this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website all about birds. So you could go and find this, just do silhouette Cornell, and this is going to pop up. And what's lovely is some of these smaller birds, we can't really see them. I think there's one in here. Where's the other one? There's a vireo. And a warbler, here's one. There's one there. Uh, where'd the other one go? Um, but they're just subtle, the way the, how about this one? Nuthatch, Nut good, how about that one? Cardinal. Cardinal, blue jay, right? All right, or titmouse, we got, who's this down here? Awesome, okay, so silhouettes, right? What's that? Gull. Oh, you guys are good. No one said seagull. I'm so impressed. <laughs> ah. All right. And how about this one? Morning dove. Morning dove? Or a kestrel. Or maybe a kestrel. Good. How about these two? Swallow. Swallow. This one? That's a swallow. swallow. And like maybe like a finch or something, yeah. right? Cool. On my way down here, there were tons of red-tailed hawks, and they're all sitting like this. And then I saw one doing this. Oh. And I was like, ooh, rough-legged hawk, right? So it was just this to this. And it was like, OK, that's great. I'm driving. I, don't even, I didn't even have to stop. It was awesome. So that's how, when you start to train your brain, you can start to, to decrease the number of birds that you're overwhelmed by, right? And if you think about habitat, too, you can do that as well. So there's lots of different types of sparrows. There's lots of different types of warblers tons of different types of flycatchers. But if we start to think about what habitat am I in, we can come up with little habitat suites of birds and we can group them. Now the Crossley book does that, which is really great. So it groups in sections. So it's not arranged taxonomically by genus and species and all that kind of gobbledygook that's just so confusing anyways. It puts them in similar habitats. You're like, yes, okay, this is great. All right, so here, we know that in this mixed Vermont woodland, right, we're going to have certain sets of birds like black-throated green warbler. Whoop, we got two on that one. Eastern wood peewee. And he's going to like that spot where there's a nice dead tree with a nice dead branch that comes out. That one's a flycatcher. We'll talk a little bit about behaviors. What do you think flycatchers do? They catch flies. Whew. And they catch them and they go zoom out and then they come back to their perch. And if you get really good with flycatchers, there's a flycatcher that comes back to the same perch. And then there's another one that doesn't like to do that. It likes to go out and go to a different perch when it comes back. And you could tell the two apart that way. So it's really kind of cool. This little one, down low, forest floor. Sometimes, though, when they're singing, they like to be up high, but they sound like they're filling the forest. That one's oven bird. Oh, who's that one? Oh, they're so saucy. Woo! Winter wren. I let wrens with that tail that just cocks right up. Doop. Just like I have, the, I have two Carolina wrens in my backyard, OK? But I'm not going to have a winter wren in my backyard because they like to be in the forest interior. Now, if we went to a totally different habitat, we're not going to see those birds, right? So I don't have to be thinking, well, is this a black-throated green warbler, or is it this type of sparrow? Because I know my little set of birds for that. OK, so this is a field, right? OK, so raptors that might be associated with fields. This is a harrier, northern harrier, that nice white rump patch. And they just glide low over the field. They're really, really beautiful. How about this one? I call it the R2-D2 bird. <laughs> See, we don't need the audio tonight. <laughs> That's a bobolink. Oh, yes. So as all those grasses come up, they're going to be down in those grasses, and they pop up, up and around. That's the male. 
that nice little yellow bonnet. Oh, I know, that's so nice, Savannah Sparrow. Savannah Sparrow in the grasslands. So there's whole sets of grassland sparrows too. So you can let go of all of those other sparrows because now I'm gonna focus on my grassland and we're gonna talk about doing your homework before you go out. Do a little bit, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm likely to see. Oh, and another bird that unfortunately is in decline, Eastern Meadowlark, spring of the year. I can't do that one very well, but they'll be back soon as well. So sets, think habitat. One of the things I like to tell people is go walk the same place over and over again for a while. One of the things that helped me so much is when I was leading bird walks at Audubon, we did a monthly bird walk and there are a number of different Audubon groups that have a monthly bird walk in the same place every month. And so you get to know the birds in that place for that habitat. If it's a really awesome site, it might be multiple habitats, but then you get to know that place and then you get to know it by the season as well, which is wonderful. All right, so, gosh, where am I gonna look? I got that bird in the binoculars, right? And it's all, it may only be there for a minute or two. This is why I like ducks, because <laughs> they hang out. I'm like, all right, we're gonna do ducks. And then when they fly, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah, because that's a whole other level. But you know, there's some birds that are nice, they sit still for you, and others that don't. So if you start to train your brain on how to look, so we're gonna look from head to tail, we're gonna gather as much information as we possibly can before we put the binoculars down and we bust open a book, okay, or the Merlin app, all right? So from the beak to the eyes, to the wings, to the belly, to the feet, which we can include the legs in there as well. Anybody hear about the pink-footed goose? Oh, that one eluded me. Up in St. Albans Bay, like 10 minutes from my house. Um, but the easy way to find the pink-footed goose was look for the bubblegum pink feet because Canada geese have black feet. So, all right. So here, we're gonna do this little exercise. So I want you to picture in your mind an American robin. And then I want you to think about how would you describe a robin to someone who's never seen a robin before? And if you start to think about like that silhouette and the size, right? Because robin's one of our size birds. And if we start to think about head to tail, what does a robin really look like? Orange. I know, orange, right. Where's the orange though? Orange and what? And the chest, how far down does it go? Not the, Not the whole way. All the way? The whole way? What's the back like? Brown. brown? Is it all brown? Is it all the same color brown? How about the beak? Yo, and this, man, we were doing this the other day. I had coloring sheets <laughs> for my son. Again, he's very intense. He likes to like really focus in on things. So we had the coloring sheets out in the bird book. And he started to color the duck, and I gave him a northern shoveler. Um, very cute. If you have kids, grandkids, Bird Dorable. Look that up online. Bird Dorable has coloring sheets. And so they're these quirky little birds. They're not like the really intense, right? This isn't coloring for adults. It's coloring for kids. But they're really accurate, okay, in terms of where, where you can color things in. So he starts coloring the beak orange. And I was like, let's, let's look it up in the book. Well, what do you see? Well, that, that one has a black one and that one has an orange one. The male and female had different color beaks, okay? How about the face, how about around the face, around the eyes? What's going on on a robin there? Whew. Did you ever know that you didn't know so much about a robin? It's just a robin. You're all gonna, you're all gonna be like, the next group of robins that you see, you're gonna be like, I had a pullover. It's a robin. Because they're really amazing when you really get to look at them, right? And if we start from the beak and we go to the, to the eye, okay, so yellow beak, it's long, right? It's a long beak, so shape of the beak is really important. I didn't really know when I first started doing this that the robin had an eye ring, a broken eye ring. What? Okay. I didn't really know that the head was darker than the back. Look at that. Where does the belly go? It goes chest, belly, almost all the way back, right? Okay. And then we have, 
Well, the undertail coverts and the vent, right? The vent and the undertail coverts. And the other thing that's nice to look at is look at the wing. This one doesn't have any wing bars, but we can look at the wings. I think back to that winter wren and his short little wings and the very long tail, right? So how far do the wings come out? How long is the tail? That kind of thing. So get that quick look head to tail and grab as much information as you can, OK? So let's have some fun. All right, the head, the beak, the eyes. So we can look for eye rings, eye lines, eyebrows, whiskers. Right, like this little thing right here, this little whisker that kind of comes out, the lure. So this is a white-throated sparrow, right? beautiful, nice white throat patch that's kind of outlined a little bit in black. This is, and then this is the lure. The lure is typically the spot between the eye and the beak, and so they some, not all. There's a there's a tan morph that doesn't have this bright yellow. It's just more, much more subdued. And then stripes across the crown, right? Kind of almost like a little white eyebrow. There's black that goes through the back, but not completely through the front on this guy. So we can get a lot of information from that. And look at the beak. This is the other thing I'm beginning to have fun with on beaks. Sometimes beaks can be two different colors, the top and the lower part of the beak. And with some sparrows, that can be really helpful when you're trying to figure out different types of sparrows. Chipping sparrow, saucy chipping sparrow, because he's kind of giving you the once over there. Dark black conical beak, right? So we know that this is like a little seed eater. Doesn't have that whisker, but it does have a little bit of white here, but doesn't have that nice outline to it. Chestnut on the top, black in here that stops. Now, this is a bird that was banded, right? Caught in a mist net by some scientists and then held really close to the camera. Right, so you're probably, unless you go visit one of the banding stations, you won't get that close up of a look. But these are the types of things that you can start to train your eye to look for really quickly as you look at a bird. Or a duck, right? Guess what this one's name is? You're pretty close, it's golden eye. Awesome, this is a common golden eye, all right? Um, and so common golden eye has a rounder patch, and then there's a barrow's golden eye that has a patch that's more shaped like a lima bean. And you're definitely not going to confuse this duck with this one, right? Because the white is in a totally different spot. Okay, so this is a buffle head. The other great thing with ducks that you can start to look at is foreheads, right? For each little group of birds, you'll learn a little thing to look at, a little hook. And with, with ducks, you can look a lot at the shape of their head. Does it, does it come right down? This one comes right down, which is really different than, I wonder if I can go backwards, right? That one has a little bit more of a slope. Nice jet black beak. The beak on this one is, is gray and black. And the patches across the back of the head. Now there's a merganser that likes to hang out with these guys that's called a hooded merganser. That could make you crazy. But don't let it, because with the hooded merganser, oop, nope, not that one. There's going to be a little outline of black here. And the hood is going to look like a fan, like a rock star mohawk fan off the back of the head. It can help you with your vireos. So vireos have a little hooked beak, a little bit more of a robust beak with a little bit of a hook on the end of it. I love this. This is called a set of spectacles. So those old-fashioned spectacles that used to balance on the bridge of your nose, right? This is a blue-headed vireo. It's not really blue, it's like a blue-gray. Don't get me started on like all the color choices for the names, because it'll drive you crazy, like purple finch. My kids are very upset about that, <laughs> very upset. There, red-eyed vireo, which is awesome too. Now, I don't know if you'll really get a chance to see that red eye ever, um, but again, this one, he's definitely got some eyebrow action going on has totally tweezed those so they're perfect, right? And a little bit of white underneath it to highlight and then gray over the top. So with some species, you can grab a lot of information, especially the warblers and the sparrows, right in the face, right? So stay as long as you can and get as much information as you can as you really look at the bird. Oh, I can't wait for these. There's some birds that are just like, oh, right? So this one, this is a magnolia warbler. 
You want to be cool, you call it a Maggie. I saw a Maggie this weekend. <laughs> not yet, they're not back yet. But right, yellow throat patch. Here's like a partial eye ring, beautiful eyebrow. Uh, the cheek patch is black. The head is a slate gray. Oh my gosh, and if you, you just can't stop moving down the body here, right? Necklace, oh, these beautiful little streaks that start to come down the body and some, some um, wing patches or wing bars, okay? And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So head, and as you move down into the body with some birds, there's a lot more information to grab, like this one. So as we start to move, we're gonna go down the body, the wings and the tail, and we're really gonna look for wing bars. Man, warblers, I thought, were the most intimidating thing in the world until I started to pick up on some of these little tricks. Like, look for wing bars or no wing bars. There's like, you can basically split the warblers in half when you do that and get rid of them. You don't have to worry about them and you just look for the ones with wing bars to help you figure it out. Um, so that's always a good thing to key your brain into. Yes or no, quick, click it off. Um, wing patch, we're gonna see one of those. Clean body versus streaky body. This is really helpful with sparrows, um, some shorebirds as well. Rump patch versus vent. If you wanna talk about the upper butt and the lower butt, um, if you look at those, and sometimes that's the only view you have when you're looking up at birds, or they're flying away from you. <laughs> oh, sorry, chestnut-sided warbler. So this guy's got this beautiful deep red brown kind of saddle on the side, a clean white through here, and wing bars. So I only jump into the wing bar category when I go to the field guide. Unlike this one, this is a black-throated blue warbler, which is beautiful and just has this little patch. Now, when I learned warblers, what I did, and this is another tip, is I went and I found the person in my community who knew more about warblers than I did. And that person, um, when I was learning warblers, was in the Mad River Valley, um, and his name is Fred Pratt. And um, Fred Pratt and uh, Pat Folsom and I all met when he invited um, folks in the community to come up and bird on his property up on Ward Hill. And the first time I ever saw this bird, he said, Bridget, remember that the black-throated blue is a gentleman and he always carries a hanky with him. And he gives the hanky to his lady when she needs it. And he told me this story because the black-throated blue female doesn't look anything like the male. She's olive drab, she's got white on the belly, She's got no face patch. It's not even like you rinsed out the male, right? Like you rinsed him out in water and there, there's the female, right? So totally different. But she had that white wing patch. She had his hanky. And I, I was like, that is the best story. It stayed with me forever and now it's yours. <laughs> so when you see the black-throated blue, so they like young, um, young hardwood forests, pole size um, trees, and a lot of undergrowth, especially hobble bush, okay? And the females love to nest in, in a hobble bush um, where those big broad leaves kind of flop over the top of the nest. So go find yourself a patch of hobble bush and then just sit in it for a while and watch for the black-throated blues. There's our white-throated uh, sparrow buddy. So with sparrows, I learned streaky and clean. So where are the streaks? And you could do it both for the belly and for the back on sparrows. And you'll see the difference when you look at something like a song sparrow, which has got all kinds of streaks up and down the front and a cluster of them in the middle. And I learned don't rely on using that cluster as the ID for song sparrow because there's a couple other sparrows that have that as well. But there's only a couple, so you have your choices again. Oh, and then there's the upper butt and the under butt, right? So this one is a wax wing, right? Do you guys have any of these down your way this year? No. No, last year, okay. So we had, we had some, um, and the way that you tell the difference between bohemian and cedar, a lot of people are like, the size, the size, but no, it's really the under butt right here. So Bohemian will have this nice rusty patch under the tail and cedar waxwings are a nice bright white. So that's really the best way to be able to, and sometimes they're mixed together. So you have a little bit of both. And then of course, there's my favorite, the butter butts. That's another good hit with kids. Um, and they're all over the place. So they'll be back soon. Um, they're in woodlands across Vermont. So we'll have um, 
some yellow rumped warblers. That's the proper, proper common name for that one. But that little um, yellow patch up um, right at the base of the tail is a really good clue for you to which warbler that is. Warblers especially um, can be really tricky, especially as leaf, um, the leaves come out. Um, and one of the spots that you can start to learn to look is the underneath the tail. And like I said, in that warbler book and in Peterson's warbler book, there's a whole page of just butts of all of the warblers. Um, so you can commit those to memory and then you'll know when you're looking up through everything just by one brief glimpse at what you have. All right, so behavior cues. So we talked a little bit about posture. Um, I'm gonna show you some with feeding, flight, and flocking. So birds have these different quirks that can like really help you hook into who that bird is. And it's just another piece of information that you can grab when you're looking at the bird. So for example, this one, this is brown creeper. Um, and so they filled the habitat niche uh, same habitat niche as nuthatches, but nuthatches go down and brown creepers go up. Okay, so if you see something going up the tree, it's more likely a brown creeper. Now there's another bird that goes horizontally across branches the same way. <laughs> and that one's a black and white warbler. Okay, so it's just that little behavior up and down. Brown creepers do this thing where they go up and they might spiral up the tree and then they go shoot and they shoot down. So the other thing that happens when you're looking at a, a woodland scape and you're trying to relax your eyes to see if anything's in there, you might not see it moving up the trunk, right? Because it's so well camouflaged, but you'll see that zip down to the bottom of the next tree that it's going to feed on. Wrens have that cocked tail. The other one that I love that has a cocked tail that I'm really hoping to see this year um, is a ruddy duck. So ducks too hold their bodies differently. And so the male ruddy duck has that tail just gets right kind of popped up in back of the duck. And so that even with a silhouette would be so obvious. You'd be like, that's who that is. All right, so different types of flight. Anybody know who this is? Kingfisher, male or female? Yes, and we always want to go male, but it's the female that has the color in this species. So she's got the rust across the breast and the male won't. So it's kind of the opposite of what we normally think with males and females. So kingfishers like to do this hovering thing. And there's certain raptors that like to, that will tend to do that too. I believe rough-legged hawks is another one that will do that hovering over a field that you won't see with other large hawks like that. If it's a small raptor and it's hovering over a field, it might be a kestrel. If it's a small hovering bird over the water, it's probably a kingfisher. So you can start to grab some of those behaviors and use those. I saw like three of these on my way down today. It was great. So this is a sign of spring to me. This is the true harbinger of spring and death. Um, <laughs> so turkey vultures are, are coming back into our area. And one of the things with raptors that you can look for is how they hold their wings, right? So if you looked at the raptor straight on, is it nice and flat out like this? If it's like that and it's really, really big, it's probably an eagle. If it's got a little bit of a tip to it, like a V, it's probably a turkey vulture. If it's doing this, it's definitely a turkey vulture because they look like they're gonna fall out of the sky when they fly, okay? So we can look at the ways different birds fly. I had a Cooper's hawk shoot through my neighborhood the other day and it was like flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide, okay? So that's just, it's just another piece of the puzzle, kind of like this. <laughs> right? We can separate our waterfowl as well into dabblers and divers. If it's somebody going butt up, you can start to look at your dabblers, okay? And maybe you get really good at identifying butts again, okay? So which one doesn't belong here? Yeah, this one. That's a mallard, orange legs. Anybody know this one? Look at this. Here's the clue right here. Pintail, woo! You can keep driving. You're like, I got it, click, ton. Don't have to wait for them to come up. No, you do. They're beautiful. The yeah, and the legs are gray. Yeah. Were you going to, on this orange. one? No. Orange. Okay. Orange, and, yes. Kind of like our bubblegum pink footed goose, right? I'm going to look at the legs. That, can, that helps with shorebirds too. Olive green legs, yellow legs, gray legs, black legs. Okay. 
All right, this is where we're gonna get creative. Okay, here we go. We're gonna talk a little bit about sound. So um, one of the things that you can do is train your ear just like you're training your eye. And one of the things that you wanna start to listen for are phrases, patterns, so things that might repeat or a pattern that you hear over and over again, pauses, so a break, and then the mnemonics which are words that we put to the sounds that we hear in order to explain what we're hearing. So this bird, the sound comes out, it's two nice clear whistles, whistle, whistle, and then it goes doo 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 doo. What you wanna just think about is a song. There we go. All right, awesome, thanks. We're gonna, we got it. Oops, no, okay. So the other, the mnemonic that comes up for this one is poor Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. <laughs> if you can whistle it, that's another clue. If I can whistle a bird's song, that is gonna give me an idea of the quality of song and help me find it a little bit easier. So whistle, whistle, do, 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 do. All right, let's do it. Let's try the next one. And I think I've got the next one queued up. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, look up Eastern Phoebe. All right. And I'm going to crank my volume up. So American Robin, right? We were talking about how we don't look at American Robins enough to really understand how to look at them and what they, what they truly look like if we we're going to describe them to somebody. And the song is something that we can hear all the time. So it's really good to train yourself on. So the song and this is one mnemonic, and I'm going to tell you, let it go. If it doesn't work for you, get rid of it and make up your own, okay? One year I was leading a walk with a group of kids, and we went down to the water. I think it's one of the, maybe an, a bird later on, um, red-winged blackbird that goes, conkleree. He goes, no, it's not saying that. <laughs> I was like, okay. He's like, it's saying Burger King. And I was like, okay, fine. That's fine. If that works for you, that's really what you should use. So yeah, you gotta be with them in their space. I'm not condoning. I'm not condoning his uh, need for Burger King in that moment. You could tell where he was, right? He wasn't on the field trip. Maybe he was then. But now we're only gonna hear Burger King. That's not. It's not really working. It's not a good one. All right, so Robins, and I'm just going to stop this because it's not working. So, cheerio, cheery me, cheerio. And it's this sing songy swinging back and forth that you can hear. Robins have a whole bunch of other voices that you can pick up on, which are little different types of alarm sounds as well. So it's a really great bird to study because it's somebody that's right in your yard and that you can start to listen for those pauses. So typically it's a set of three with like a break in between. And it's this diddly, 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 da-da-da, diddly, diddly, Okay, and it might change up a little bit. You know, the male's got to switch it up to attract the female. So that's why you're going to hear variation in songs too. So one robin might like put a little bit more scoop on it than another one, but it's still going to be in that same pattern so the females know this is, this is the guy I'm looking for. All right, so let's see if we can. Whoop. All right, so this one's easy to do too. All right, all right, I'm not going to worry. You, let's try. We'll play it. All right, so this one goes Phoebe, Phoebe. So I always think of it as a bird that's asking its name, am I Phoebe? And then it answers it, Phoebe. So it goes up and then it goes down and it's got a little bit of a burry, burry quality to it. So Phoebe, Phoebe. So it answers itself. The other thing with Phoebes, because flycatchers all look a lot alike, okay? They're very, very hard to tell apart. We want to listen to the voice, and then we want to look for behaviors. Phoebes do this little thing where they scoop and wag their tail. And there's some thought that it's a way for the male and female to stay within visual contact of one another. So that when the female's sitting on the nest, she can scan the landscape and see that the male has come in to feed her, right? Because he's supposed to do that, to help her out. 
um, but he's waiting to make sure that it's safe. So his tail is just kind of going back and forth a little bit. Oh, all right. Now, this one is a little sad that we don't have this, but you can go to All About That. All About Bird site has this song on it. So this is our state bird. This is the hermit thrush, and they have a beautiful ethereal sound. Now, if you think of going into the woodlands during May and June and that beautiful fluty sound that comes over you in waves, it's one of the best things when I get in the woods in the springtime and, and I hear my first one. It's just so magical. And what makes it even more magical is because the bird is harmonizing with itself. So it's singing two notes at the same time. And they can do that because their vocal cords are different than ours. They have a syrinx instead of a larynx. So they can sing these two songs at a time. Now, a number of years ago, I was in a play by David Budbill. And he actually hired me not only to be an actress, but actually be the bird coach as well. And so I coached some of the actors and actresses to make bird songs with their voice because he didn't want to use any recordings. And so we had a guy in the chorus who could whistle and hum at the same time so it sounded a lot like a hermit thrush. It was really beautiful. So the hermit thrush holds the first note and says, why don't you come to me? And it might come up on the end. And then sometimes it'll go down, okay? So it's this beautiful up and down fluty sound, but it's harmonizing with itself and it's just magical. Hermit holds. Let's see, you got it? He's gonna play it from the back. There we go. You guys are so good to me, thank you. There. The rushes can be hard to tell apart by sight and sound, but it's a great group of birds to get to know um, and to listen for. So a lot of it has to do with looking at the color of the, the body across the back and down to the tail. You notice the tail on the hermit thrush is very rusty. The spots are blurry, kind of fuzzy quality to them, okay? Wood thrush, strong, bold spots. And then Viri is like totally washed out spots and lovely cinnamon, like in a really even color all down the back. And they all have these beautiful ethereal sounds that you can learn to pick one out at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself when you're trying to learn new groups of birds, right? You're like, whoa, <laughs> take, take one group at a time. Like this past fall when the shorebirds were all moving through, that's what I focused on. And in the spring, I was like, I want to learn more about sparrows. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on those things. So little bits at a time. So, you know, they're digestible, right? And the other thing to do is do your homework, right? Don't go out there to a brand new spot and not be prepared and be like, whatever, I got my Birds of North America guide. I'm set, <laughs> right? Like know where you're, where you're going to go. Know what season it is, right? So for me, this past fall when the shorebirds were really starting to move through in Vermont, that's what I focused on, right? Because that's the time of year to do that. Um, right now, waterfowl are moving through. So it's a really great time to look for a pink-footed goose amongst all the Canada geese, right? Who knows? Um, tap into the birding community. There's a Vermont bird list and there's a Facebook group that you can be a part of and um, be having conversations and sharing photos. Um, use eBird to research whatever you are focused on. How many of you have used eBird before? Okay, how many haven't? Okay, so give it a shot because it's really amazing. So basically what I can do is I can go to eBird and I can look up a spot, like this is how I know Martha's been birding this week. <laughs> because Martha enters all of her sightings into eBird. And basically it's also a way to pay it forward and give back, right? There can't be an ornithologist in every backyard, but there's tons of amateur ornithologists all over the country. And what, what you're able to do is contribute your sightings and it helps us track trends, um, population growth, decline, whether things are coming back early or late, right? We knew that the geese were like two to three weeks early because people were reporting it online. You can also be a big cheater 
and find out what's where before you get there, which I love to do as a bird guide because then I am totally prepared. So in Sausa, this bird here on the day before my walk and I can come into a field walk, it's not magic. I'm just, I'm just using all of your information to <laughs> figure it out. So it's there for you too. And the strength of eBird is based on the strength of the birding community in your region. And so the more people that use it and learn to use it, the more valuable it becomes. Brush up on the birds you're likely to see before you go. So that Crossley book, like I sit down with that book. If I'm going to go lead a trip at West Haven um, at Helen Buckner Preserve for TNC, I go and I study my prairie warbler and all my golden winged warblers. I make sure I know what to map out in my brain before I go. Can I uh, ask a question about Facebook? Because yeah. I don't know this site. So yeah. you just go on Facebook, do you ask to be a friend of what? So there's a Vermont Birding Facebook group. So if you put in the search bar up above Vermont Birding, um, the group will come up. I, th I believe it's a private group, but you just ask to be a part of it, and, yeah. and then you're in. And, and I will tell you, so the Vermont Bird Listserv is great, um, but it yeah but the and the bird list serve can be a little intense um birders can be intense right my first experience with birders was not great and email is a really easy way to detach yourself from having a, com a conversation with someone about what they saw or what they didn't see um and so it that can be a hard place um, the softer place <laughs> is is the facebook community group um and so uh, a lot of us on there Photographs. It's lots of photographs right. and, and lots of posts about what's coming up and things like that. And what some of us are trying to do are start to train people about how to post. So I saw this bird here in this town during this time of day in this habitat, right? So all of those pieces help. And then as the person responding, I don't just say, yeah, that's a yellow-headed grosbeak. I say that's a yellow-headed grosbeak because I saw this on the head and this is what the beak is shaped like. And I looked it up on eBird and there does seem to be one in your community. So <laughs> this, is, this is how we grow the community and we support one another in, in learning. So I think getting out there is the most important thing and this is a great time of year to start, right? And winter is a great time of year to embrace your backyard birds and get to know all of those. So if you know your backyard, you know when stuff drops out of the sky that's not supposed to be there. My backyard goes off in May. It's incredible during the migration. And I'm in downtown St. Albans. I got a little brook that runs through my backyard and a little patch of forest. But it's amazing. Um, I had a Wilson's warbler there, which is rare. So these birds that are moving to breed up north. I had, um, what was the other one? Bay-breasted warbler. And it was all because... I got up and I got out there at dawn with a nice cup of coffee. No one else is up yet. I'm like, yes, this is great. And I just listen. And then I, and then I look at the treetops. And I've got a nice mixture of hardwoods and softwoods and shrubs that are low and things that are somewhere in the middle and lots of gardens. So I have good habitat for them. And I just listen. And anything that's out of the ordinary, if I don't know it right away, I track it down with my binoculars. I find it. I find it. I stay out there when I get your own cereal. I got a bird I got to find out here. So stay with it. And that, but your backyard can be a real treasure. Find a monthly bird walk so you get to know a spot. And you meet other birders. This is the other thing. Go and find those people who know a little bit more than you. I think there's some in this room. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Um, Bird by habitat, always keep that in mind. Um, that's one of the first questions I ask people. They'll, they'll send me emails with questions about birds, and I'll say, well, where are you? What part of the state are you in? What's the habitat like around your house? So think of all of those things as well. And then pay attention to the season. My backyard goes off in May, and then it's really quiet. There's, you know, I know who's going to be there during the breeding season. And then the fall is when it's going to peak again. Um, and I'm going to have good stuff. And then I'll have another, hopefully, you know, hopefully a little something. Man, we had pine gross beaks in my neighborhood this year, um, bohemian wax wings. And that's because all my neighbors have those ornamental um, crab apples. And they have ash trees, mountain ash trees in their yard. <coughs> so we have great birds. And I just know when, when to look and when to be there. And eBird can totally help you with that. Can I 
can I plug a monthly walk? Yes, yes, uh, please. Hildy. And Hildy, <laughs> do a monthly walk. And April, there'll be two. Good. The 8th and the 22nd. Awesome. It's at 7 o'clock at the Welcome Center. And then every month, and we love eyeballs. We're in, uh, you know, yes. People that come, even if you don't know. More people is always better. I'm always surprised when I lead a walk, like the new person that shows up that doesn't have the binoculars is like, everybody's looking this way, and that person is over here going, what's that? And it's something like completely rare. <laughs> You're like, are you serious? My husband sees the best stuff. Hun, can you come in the backyard? I think there's, there's something that looks like a blue jay, but like the colors are off. It was like a, mo a northern mockingbird. We never had one in the backyard. And you just also, the brandy of the bird, uh, Vermont Bird Place, brings binoculars. So if you don't oh. have binoculars, he has them there available to share. <gasps> that is a treasure. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That's a, bit, that's a big deal. And try different binoculars, right? Try different things because everybody's eyes are different and everybody's face is different and your eyes are different, you know, shapes and far distance apart. So you got to try a lot of things. Um, so because we were having problems with the sound, I didn't even try to um, ask to test this, but um, I was going to do a little dive in here, but you can do this on your own. So this is Vermont eBird. This is the Explore Data page. And basically, there's a whole bunch of categories below here where you can do a deep dive into the information that's online there. And you can, you can hone it down to your county. So before I came down here, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't something rare that I didn't know about. And so I went on eBird and I looked things up. And so you can explore a region and you can put your county in there. Below here, there's something called hotspots. So this is another great thing. So if you want to know, where do I go birding? Where could I go? You could go anywhere in the country, and these little hotspots will pop up. And you can click on that, and it'll give you a bird list of the site. It's like, yes. And, and even right down to um, what was seen. Um, if, you, if you explore a region, too, you can find out who the biggest e-birder is in your county, like who submitted the most lists. There's an Andrew guy down here that's, that's got, there we go, yes, that's got a lot. You're, you're close behind him, though. Yeah, you're right in there with that. Um, so it's really fun. And um, this is managed, uh, Vermont eBird is managed by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies mainly. Um, they're really awesome. And what I love about this platform is they respond to what birders are interested in. Um, so this, the site has evolved to provide birders with the type of data that they're interested in. So this is like a giving back thing to us as well. Um, when people had a question um, for me about why there weren't any goldfinches one year, um, here in Vermont, I went to eBird and I looked that up. People weren't having a lot of uh, goldfinches at their feeder in around where I lived. And when I went online and I looked and I compared years, I found that the higher snowfall, goldfinches tend to disperse because it's harder for them to find the seeds that they really like. Um, and so they had pushed out of the area. When someone started to argue with me that, yes, the American robin is the true harbinger of spring, I went online here and I created a chart that showed that no, robins are here all year and here's where the woodcock drops off and is gone and then comes back and here's red winged blackbird and here's turkey vulture. Yes! Good data. Um, it was my husband, so. Locked in, locked in, totally locked in. All right, okay, so speaking of data, then this is my, my, one, my one doom and gloom slide. So this is from uh, the Audubon um, report, I believe from 2014, um, looking at trends in bird populations in, in different habitats. And this is one of the things that I find really fascinating when we start to think about learning birds by habitat, and then we get connected, and then we're trying to take action to protect different habitats. So as you can see here, right, we've got um, grassland birds, arid lands, which aren't here, but if we look at grasslands, eastern forests, and wetlands for our region, right, you're gonna, this is really fascinating. So from 1970 to 2010, we're seeing a drop in all of these kind of inland bird species, right? Eastern forests and grasslands, way, way down. But here's wetlands here. Anybody have any idea why that is? There you go, exactly. 
two words, Ducks Unlimited. So this powerful group that was able to move conservation action quickly, right? So wildlife refuges, um, wetland protection, um, all of that pushed really hard. So I think of the power that we as a birding community have in, in look, taking this data, and some of this data is from us. Some of the data that Audubon put together to show these trends in their report came from us. And what I love is, as we start, I think of um, West Rutland Audubon Society and how they've used some of their data with the towns in their service area to protect different habitats and places, to create town forests, things of that nature. Um, so your observations, the things that you're connecting with and then hopefully e-birding can then be used as ways that we can conserve some of these forest and grassland habitats. And they are in decline here in the state right now, both grasslands and eastern forests. Can you explain why? Yep, habitat fragmentation, habitat conversion. Um, so when we break up these beautiful tracts of forest and we chop them into smaller pieces, um, even when, um, and I think of my desire to have a home out in the woods, right? We create these little kind of ripple effects of, um, of, of just impacts, whether it's an invasive plant that can now get in there a little bit easier or a different predator that can get in there. Or if we think about larger developments in our town, where should we site um, growth? How do we use smart growth to our advantage and how do we look at core habitat blocks, whether it's uh, grassland, and grasslands are a little bit different, right? So grasslands are hard to keep as grasslands. Shrub scrub is hard to keep as shrub scrub, so it needs to be managed. Um, Martha and I met on the Nature Conservancy's um, bird warbler walk at the West Haven Preserve, which is called the Helen Buckner Preserve. And that place is actively managed now for the shrub scrub species of the blue winged warbler, golden winged warbler, and prairie warbler. But it takes work, it takes dollars, it takes some volunteers to get out there to keep that habitat that way. And then instead of looking at things in pockets as well, I think what we can do is look on a, on a landscape scale. My other hat that I wear is for a group called Cold Hollow to Canada, which works with groups of landowners with contiguous properties. And we're in these seven towns right along the northernmost reach of the Green Mountains, which is known as the Cold Hollow Mountains. And we pull landowners together that have adjoining properties that are in core forest habitat with high connectivity throughout the, the whole um, northern forest linkage all the way up into Quebec. And we give them management practices on a landscape scale. Rather than having everybody manage in their own little pocket, we give them recommendations that say, hey, your neighbor has lots of early successional shrub scrub habitat. You don't need to create it on your, habit on your property because what you have is core coniferous forest and we want to keep that there. So as communities, we can look at like all of our resources, right, and then start to manage there. Oh, you can, I could stay up on the soapbox for a while there. Like, I, like, how do we value habitat as infrastructure in our communities as well? How can we start valuing it that way so it becomes a core part of our community planning moving forward? All of that stuff. Okay, it was just one slide, but it just kept going. All right. Oh, and this, is, this was the fun part. So I'm going to mimic the bird. <laughs> It's going to fade in, and we're going to see if you can guess what it is. OK, so they're going to start easy, and then they're going to get harder. This is the fun end. Even, even more fun now that I'm going to mimic all of this, OK? So this one is singing right now. It's been singing since February, and it goes, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. And it's not doing the lovely fade. Oh, my technology is fading me. So. Hey, sweetie is the song for the chickadee, and chickadee dee 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 is the call, is the contact call for the bird. Yeah, that's a song and the this and the that and the this. I've had people say, oh, I have Phoebe's back already in February. Nope. Listen, okay, so hey, sweetie, Phoebe, Phoebe, right? But it's got some qualities that are the same, but as you fine tune your ear, you're going to hear some differences. All right, let's see what else we can do. Oh, I don't know if I can do this one. Okay. Purdy, 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 purdy. Witch year, witch year, witch year. 
Thank you. All right. Um, Northern Cardinal. I have never done that one before. That is not one I would, I would um, coach. Um, clear notes. These are the other ways that you can fine tune your ear to song. Is it burry? Does it trill? Does it have a clear note? Could I whistle it? All right. Let's see what else we got. Oh, I already did this one. Burger King. There's our guy, Conclary. I heard these in my neighborhood before I saw them this year. It was pretty cool. Or if you're near the Canadian border, it's aujourd'hui, <laughs> like me. All right, OK, and this is our last one. So just from the description, there we go. Someone's got it. Good. And then the <laughs> at dusk in a nice open field, maybe with some poplars nearby. This time of year, you can hear this guy. And we can keep our eye out for them. Um, they migrated early. Um, I don't know if you saw, I think it was in the New York Times, there was a story about, yeah, lots of them showing up in the park, but showing up dead because of the, the cold snap was just too much. So the cues from down south, a lot of things are two to three weeks early, and some things are more hardy than others, and they're going to do all right, and they can move and shift. But if you think about being a woodcock, what do they eat? Where do they hang out? They, they probe the ground for worms and invertebrates, and that's really just not not going to work. I got an email from a friend that was like, I opened the barn door today and this woodcock shot out. And I was like, yay, leave the barn door open tonight so it can get back in there and stay warm. All right. Well, I would be happy to take any questions from folks. Um, I thank you so much for your patience with the technology and my bird impressions. Um, you can find me at birddiva.com. My email is birddiva at gmail.com. And I am on Facebook as birddiva. Um, I not only do walks um, and talks, but I also do um, work with landowners. So last year, I helped a landowner set up a uh, monitoring walk on her property. She has trails on her property that she really loves. And what I did is I spent two days with her, and we went and set points out on that walk. And I gave her a list of core breeding birds that were appropriate for her habitat site and then recommendations to go with her forest management plan. So now she has a walk that she can do and a set of birds to listen for that will help her kind of gauge the health of her forest. Um, the other landowner wanted a full breeding bird survey, um, but she also wanted me to teach her how to do it. Um, and so we did the same thing and we looked at, she had 400 acres and we picked five points in different habitats. And then I taught her how to do a dawn chorus breeding bird survey through each of those points so that she can gather some data to help inform her management plan as well. So those options are available too. So does anybody have any questions? Could yeah. Just mention a little bit about the Bobolink project here? Yeah. So the Bobolink project, I'm pretty sure, let's see, UVM is involved in it. Um, Audubon Vermont is involved in it. And the Bobolink project, what it does is it pays farmers, it's an incentive program to pay farmers to basically delay when they're cutting their fields. So um, you can get a number of cuts out of a field, which you really need to be able to keep livestock going. Um, and what the program does is the um, landowner can um, enter in and basically put out, like, this is what I'm willing to do, this is how many acres I have, and this is what the cost would be. And then we, as the community, we throw down, um, we donate, and that builds the pot of money for local um, landowners that want to be a part of the project. And then they go through, the scientists go through, and they rank all the different areas, and they look at the success of where we could help the, the bobolinks, and then they apply the money to that. In my region this year, our little birding community that's starting to grow, um, we started to like put things out. So we posted stuff on Front Porch Forum and we tried to get some more information out there and then we all tried to contribute to it so that we can um, support some more landowners in Franklin County. Hopefully this, this one landowner who has upland sandpipers on their land, which is just so cool, they're really rare. Um, so it's a really great project. You can either donate or, and or you can find a farmer um, or landowner who might 
be open to delaying mowing and, and get them a little money to be able to do that. I believe there's money too through NRCS to do work like that. There's a lot of money through NRCS right now for early successional habitat as well. So there's a lot of different resources out there um, that folks can tap into to improve habitat. Awesome. West Haven walk is May 20th. So this is the Nature Conservancy walk at the Helen Buckner Preserve. It's a Saturday morning, May 20th. They'll be announcing that probably pretty soon. You do have to register for it because I can't take 50 people. So we try to keep it small and we've had really great success there. Well, thanks you guys so much for coming. I hope to cross paths with you again.